All Bones Considered, Laurel Hill Stories number 50 for May 2023. A couple of haunted houses, Balleroy and Grey Towers Castle. East is a National Historic Landmark, an arboretum, a sculpture garden, a nature preserve, and an active cemetery in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It opened in 1836 and remains a popular visiting spot for tens of thousands of visitors every year. Its sister cemetery, Laurel Hill West, located across the Schuylkill River in Balakinwood, was founded in 1869. It has a history and a population of its own. I am Joe Lex, retired professor of emergency medicine at Temple University in Philadelphia, volunteer tour guide at Laurel Hill East and Laurel Hill West, and volunteer podcaster. This is episode number 50 of All Bones Considered Laurel Hill Stories. Can you believe that? I promised you a podcast about people with colleges and universities named for them, but that is going to have to wait because in a six-week period I committed to giving two brand new tours at Laurel Hill West plus two virtual tours one for Laurel Hill West and one for the Grow Oakwell Stonelay Preservation Group that one's done it's already posted on YouTube plus I had to plan to record my weekly radio show plus I adjudicated several plays for the Independence High School Musical Awards and the Barrymore Awards for Philadelphia Theater. In other words, I was overbooked. Rather than postpone the podcast release date, I thought that I could do an emergency podcast about something that seems obvious for a cemetery podcast that I've never done before, haunted houses. Now, I thought about my friend, author, director, actor, Josh Hitchens, who helped me get a reading from my one-person play about Father Cyril Sigourney's Webster Fay, whom I told you about back in All Bones Considered Laurel Hill Stories number 19, The Other Side of Paradise, Laurel Hill's F. Scott Fitzgerald Connections. Josh also tells ghost stories for a living. You may have seen him at the Gravedigger's Ball in 2021. Last year, he published a terrific book called Haunted History of Philadelphia for Arcadia Press. You can find it on his website, joshhitchens.com. I remembered that two of his stories had Laurel Hill connections. George Gordon Mead Easby spent most of his life living in a haunted Chestnut Hill mansion he had named Balleroy. Sugar tycoon William Harrison had his family castle, designed by Horace Trumbauer, built in Glenside. Now it serves as administrative offices and dormitories for Arcadia University. It's called Grey Tower Castle, and it's haunted, along with much of the rest of the university. With Josh's permission, I used his stories as the skeleton for this podcast. So instead of the usual five or six days, I was able to put my scripts together in only two days. I don't think you'll be disappointed. Whether you believe in ghosts or not, and I don't, they still make for an entertaining story. Welcome to episode number 50 of All Bones Considered Laurel Hill Stories. A couple of haunted houses of Balleroy and Grey Towers Castle. (laughs) 
Chestnut Hill is unquestionably one of the most beautiful neighborhoods in Philadelphia. It is filled with affluent homes, picturesque tree-lined streets, and charming local businesses. It's a delight to explore on foot. Less than two blocks from the business district along brick-paved Germantown Avenue, and nestled at 111 West Mermaid Lane, overlooking a tributary of the Wissahickon, is a 32-room mansion called Balleroy, named after a luxurious French chateau. For many years, Balleroy was called the most haunted house in America. The occupant of that house, for most of his 87 years, was the wealthy and eccentric George Gordon Meade Easby, whom everyone called Meade. When you asked him, he would happily tell you about the spectral visions in his family home, and some of them were relatives. As his name implies, George Gordon Meade Easby had a military man in his lineage. His mother was Henrietta Meade Large Easby. Her mother was Sarah Wise Meade Large, whose father was indeed the hero of Gettysburg, General George Gordon Meade, buried at Laurel Hill East in Section L. That branch of the family could trace its roots in the United States to Nicholas Walln, who had sailed with William Penn on the welcome when it landed in Philadelphia in 1683. There are a couple of dozen Walns at Laurel Hill. At least seven signers of the Declaration of Independence had some Easby blood flowing in their veins. Meade's father was May Stevenson Easby, whose lineage goes back to Easby Abbey in Yorkshire, England, around 1150. May's mother was Elizabeth Clifford Stevenson Easby. Elizabeth's brother was Cornelius Stevenson, who was married to Egyptologist Sarah York Stevenson. You heard about her in All Bones Considered Laurel Hill Stories number 48, Shattering Some Glass Ceilings. If you remember, Cornelius and Sarah's son, Cornelius Stevenson, married paint heiress Christine Wetherill, founder of the Hollywood Bowl and the Philadelphia Art Alliance. I talked about her in All Bones Considered Laurel Hill Stories number 24. So in addition to being George Gordon Meade's great-grandson, Meade Easby was Sarah York Stevenson's nephew and Cornelius and Christine Stevenson's cousin. Another great-grandchild of General Meade and first cousin to Meade was Margareta Large Fittler Murphy Rockefeller, better known as Happy Rockefeller. She was second wife to Nelson Rockefeller, one time governor of New York and vice president under Gerald Ford. Happy's grandfather was Edwin Fittler, Philadelphia mayor from 1887 to 1891. Fittler Square is named for him, and he has the tallest obelisk at Laurel Hill East. The house that would become Balleroy was built on a half-acre lot on West Mermaid Lane in Chestnut Hill in 1911. Purportedly, a carpenter built it for himself and his family. The legend is that he murdered his wife inside the mansion and then committed suicide on the property but I find no confirmation of that in the newspapers of the day. Zillow.com currently describes the house as 32 rooms, 7 bedrooms, 7 baths, 7,000 square feet. The Easby family purchased the house in 1926. They called it Mermaid Gables. The name Balleroy came after Meade inherited it in 1969. They moved from their Center City townhouse at 2119 Pine Street. Patriarch Major May Stevenson Easby was a veteran of the Great War with the 305th Cavalry of the Pennsylvania National Guard. He was named after his grandfather, Adam May Stevenson. He made a fortune as a Philadelphia banker. His wife, Henrietta Meade Large Easby, was described by Meade as prim and preserved, a Victorian lady of few words. The two children at the time were George Gordon Mead Easby, who was eight years old, and his six-year-old brother, May Stevenson Easby Jr., who everyone called Stevie. Stevie was a Leap Day baby, born in 1920, 
and had suffered brain injury at birth. Years later, Meade told an interviewer, When my brother and I first arrived here at Balleroy, we looked in the fountain, and I saw my reflection in it. But instead of his reflection, it was a skeleton, and that was really very unnerving. And shortly after that, he died. Whether that was a warning he was going to, it could have been. Stevie Easby was indeed not yet 11 years old when he died of convulsions in 1931. He was interred in the Stevenson family plot at Laurel Hill East in Section T. Many people, including older brother Mead, believe that Stevie became one of the many ghosts to haunt Balleroy. Not long after his funeral, Mead reported seeing an apparition of Stevie in the room where he had died. And over the years, many others could see Stevie looking out of the window of that room. One eyewitness was Dave Belts, a contractor who did some restoration work at Balleroy in the 1990s. Belt said, eh, me being a contractor, working in a lot of other places, and then coming here to Balleroy, it seemed really strange. We've had all kinds of different encounters. Footsteps, cold drafts, doors opening, ashtrays moving from one side of the table to the other. We were here working one day, doing something, and we heard a loud crash. Dave and Meade investigated. They found a painting that had been hanging on the wall was now on the floor more than 10 feet away. The nail on which the painting had hung was still tightly in the wall. The wire on the back of the painting was intact. The painting was a portrait of Stevie. It wasn't long after this mysterious incident that Dave and his co-worker saw Stevie's ghost. We were in the courtyard, and I noticed somebody looking out the window at me, and I said to my buddy, look at that, there's some little guy looking at us. A young kid with blonde hair, I'd say ten at the most, maybe eight. And then it just faded off, and my buddy said, man, that was really strange. My buddy never came back after that. He was really scared. He just said that he felt somebody stare at him all the time. Now, when Dave told Mead of this encounter, Mead said, I feel that must have been my brother. What was it like for George Gordon Mead Easby to grow up in a haunted mansion that was part museum? As a child attending Chestnut Hill Academy, he was surrounded by thousands of antiques and historical artifacts, including a clock that had belonged to Marie Antoinette a watch, a snuff box, and a chair that had been owned by Napoleon Bonaparte, flatware used by the signers of the Declaration of Independence at the meal they ate just before signing that seminal document. He did his homework at his great-grandfather's desk, where he once found an unsent letter from the general asking for more horses for his troops. Now, when asked about ghostly spirits, Meade said rather matter-of-factly, Occasionally I would see a figure in the room when it wasn't there. You'd hear people going up the stairs when no one was here. Things like that. I was brought up never to believe in ghosts. When he was 18, Meade studied illustration at the Philadelphia College of Art, now the University of the Arts. At a 1941 art exhibit at the Print Club, Meade received special notice The humorist among the exhibitors is George G. Mead Easby, who's at the movies, and are your slumbers disturbed? Not only good fun, but good art in the realm of caricature. His Glimpse of the Universe, a map-like design in color, and Reverie, an oil study of a girl, are further evidence of this young artist's versatility. Mead was drafted during the Second World War. He spent his time patrolling the Atlantic coast from an airplane. He continued his work as a political cartoonist, and one of his works, entitled Air Power Frankenstein, which showed the United States claiming victory over the Nazi regime of Germany, received a presidential citation from Franklin Delano Roosevelt due to its powerful message of patriotism. His father, who had served in the Great War, also served with the Coast Guard during World War II. But after the war, May Easby spent virtually every day at the Rittenhouse Club, 
imbibing his favorite scotch. With the war ended, Easby began a career as a theater actor. He performed in productions at the Cape Cod Playhouse with Gertrude Lawrence, the legendary actress who originated roles in many of Noel Coward's plays, including Private Lives, as well as being the original Anna in the first Broadway production of the Rodgers and Hammerstein musical, The King and I, which was written especially for her. Meade then went west to Hollywood and found work as an actor and producer for several low-budget films, although I find no record of his work in the Internet Movie Database. Meade invested wisely. He paid $75 to $125 a share for a stock called IBM in its early days. And by 1972, that stock had split nine times. He was also part owner of Jackson and Moyer Clothing Store at 1610 Chestnut Street. In 1954, he became public relations director for the Technographic Company, located at 1422 Chestnut Street. He acquired a boat, which he called Marsuin, and frequently piloted up and down the coast. He was an accomplished social dancer, and his name was frequently in the society pages of various Philadelphia newspapers. Meade's mother, Henrietta Meade Large Easby, died in 1962 after a long illness. When his father died at age 90 in 1969, he had left Meade a letter to be read after his death. It stated that he had seen many ghosts at Balleroy and that Meade would see them too and not to be afraid. One of the ghosts that May had seen was his wife, Henrietta. Pieces from the collection occasionally came on the market. In 1969, a choice Chippendale mahogany high boy sold at auction for $60,000. The purchaser was collector of Americana H. Richard Dietrich, Jr., owner of the Luden's Cough Drop and Candy Company. Dietrich is interred in the Franconia section of Laurel Hill West. The Chippendale ended up in the map room of the White House. Meade had inherited more than 100,000 historical artifacts worth millions of dollars, many of which had been in his family for centuries. His time was now occupied with opening business checks, paying bills, and cataloging his massive collection. He wanted to make Balleroy a museum, a private museum, as well as his home. In May 1972, Meade got a long write-up in the Inquirer. There was a photo of him, impeccably dressed with impossibly black hair and oversized sunglasses. He was standing with a glass of champagne in front of his blue and silver 1952 Rolls-Royce. His chauffeur was in the background. There was a bar and a table in the limousine with Waterford Crystal, of course. The car once belonged to Pakistani Prince Ali Khan, son of Aga Khan. The article mentioned that the house and its contents were insured for $2 million, which Meade estimated to be about 40% of market value. Despite Meade's constant worry about fire, the reporter noted that the mansion was lit primarily by dozens of candles. Electric lights played only a small role of illumination. And Meade had a lit lark cigarette in his hand throughout the entire interview. Meade later confided to Charles J. Adams III, the author of Philadelphia Ghost Stories, My mother died before my father, and she came back to him, into his room, and stood by his bed twice. The nurse also saw her. She was wearing a sort of nightgown. Two or three of my friends have seen her. The ghost of Henrietta Easby often appeared as a severe-looking woman dressed all in black, walking with a cane. The loud, persistent pounding of a cane on the upper floors where Henrietta Easby died was often heard echoing through the halls of Balleroy in the dead of night. Meade also became a talk show host on Philadelphia radio for many years. He served 25 years on the Fine Arts Commission of the U.S. State Department. In 1995, he was appointed as an executive director to the Under Secretary of State. He gladly loaned many pieces from his priceless collection to the U.S. State Department, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, 
Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the White House. All of them were catalogued under the name the Belleroy Collection. Many experts considered it the most important private collection of American antiquities. An article in the 4 November 1975 Philadelphia Inquirer told in somewhat coded language about a possible assignation gone horribly wrong. This is all, quote, A chance meeting in a center city restaurant with a man who professed an interest in antiques led to a great embarrassment for the squire of Balleroy Mansion in Chestnut Hill, George Gordon Mead Easby. It also led to a string of five criminal charges against John Tunstra, 31, of 51st Street near Thompson Street. The charges are robbery, theft, receiving stolen property, threatening to do bodily harm, and reckless endangerment. According to police, it all began two weeks ago when Easby, 57, and Tunstra met. Tunstra said he was interested in antiques, a subject dear to Easby's heart. So Easby invited Tunstra to drop in at his Mermaid Lane mansion. At 8.20 p.m. Sunday, Tunstra did so. After a brief look at Easby's extensive collection of fine antiques, they went to dinner at 21 West, a restaurant at 21 West Highland Avenue in Chestnut Hill. When they returned to Bailaroy, though, the bonds of friendship began to wear thin. In fact, Easby later complained to police Tunstra threatened to steal Easby's collection of antique watches. He had about 500 antique watches. Then he said he was going to strangle Easby with a towel and kick his teeth out. All this made Easby so nervous that he got himself a bottle of champagne to sip. Tunstra had scotch, a fifth and a half of it, according to police. After 14 hours, Tunstra decided to settle for Easby's check for $1,500 and $60 in cash from Easby's wallet. When Tunstra left, Easby called the police. Tunstra was apprehended yesterday morning at a Center City bank trying to cash Easby's check, police said. All I could find about John Tunster was that in 1963, when he was 18 years old, he had been arrested in Media, Pennsylvania and charged with a series of burglaries. I don't know the end result of that arrest. Self-proclaimed psychic Judith Richardson Hames described her first visit. I'll never forget the first time I walked through the front doors of Balleroy. The first words out of my mouth were, my God. God, I can't believe how many spirits are in this house. When you walk into a place like Balleroy and you see the silver that was used for the meal by the gentlemen who were ready to sign the Declaration of Independence, you certainly have to pull some wonderful energy from something like that. And yes, that's the same Judith Hames who in 1986 sued Temple University Hospital when she claimed to lose her psychic abilities after suffering an allergic reaction to an iodinated contrast material, which was injected before she was to receive a brain CT scan. She was awarded more than $600,000 for pain, suffering, and loss of income, but the award was later overturned on appeal. Well, unlike the ghosts of little brother Stevie and mother Henrietta, The other spirits haunting Balleroy seem to be tied to the objects in the collection rather than the house itself, including the clock once owned by Marie Antoinette. But there were also the desk and the dining table of General Meade, as well as his sidearm. There was an oil lamp from the ruins of Pompeii. There was an 18th century grandfather clock, which seemed to be a favorite of the ghost of Thomas Jefferson, as he was seen there several times. Now, if you remember, Jefferson's favorite clockmaker, Thomas Voigt, was a Philadelphian who's interred at Laurel Hill East. It kind of makes sense then. You can hear more about the Jefferson Voigt connection in All Bones Considered Laurel Hill Stories number 43 Tick Tock, Clocks, Watches, and Laurel Hill. The most notorious piece of antique furniture connected with paranormal activity at Balleroy was a beautiful blue upholstered wing-back chair 
once owned by Napoleon Bonaparte. It was supposedly crafted by an 18th century warlock. The chair was in the blue room, which Meade said was the most haunted room in the house. And at least four people who sat in that chair died only a short time afterwards. Meade said in an interview, Well, that's gotten the nickname of the death chair because quite a few people who did sit in it died shortly thereafter, so now I don't let anyone sit in it. The death chair was apparently related to a Baleroy ghost that Meade called Amanda. And one of the four people who died was the curator of Baleroy, Paul Kimmons, a self-trained interior decorator who had recently redesigned the editorial board offices for the Philadelphia Inquirer. He worked as a volunteer at Baleroy for many years and had never experienced anything unusual, laughing off his employer's tales of Amanda's spirit. But one night in 1972, Kimmons was giving psychic Judith Richardson Hames a tour of the house when he saw a ghostly woman in period dress walk down the staircase. I see that woman. She's there, Paul said. A few weeks later, Haynes got a phone call from Kimmons, who was in a state of terror. He told her, I'm not a hysterical person, but Amanda is following me. I look in my rearview mirror, and she's there. I wake up at home, and she's there. I'm walking down the street, and I catch a glimpse of her out of the corner of my eye. She's scaring me to death. I think I'm losing my mind. An exhausted Paul Kimmons sank into Napoleon's blue wingback chair and poured out the whole story to Meade. Always in perfect health, Paul Kimmons suddenly died on 25 August 1972, just a short time after sitting in the chair. He was 47 years old. It was after that Meade put a silk robe over the arms of the death chair and never let anyone else sit in it for the rest of his days at Balleroy. Of the blue room itself, Meade said, You feel that you're in the presence of somebody else. Now, many people have gone into that room when it was empty and have told me they feel someone in there. I had some friends here one night after my mother died, and her favorite cabinet was the one behind them. They were sitting in the blue room, and it unlocked itself, and the doors swung open, and that scared them, so I think they departed. In the late 1990s, Lloyd Gross, a close friend of Meade, was interviewed about the ghosts of Balleroy for the television series Haunted History on the History Channel and Sightings on the Sci-Fi Channel. Gross said, I do feel very uncomfortable here. There are many sounds in the night. You hear creaking, and you hear banging and different things. It just seems that there's something very, very strange about it, not like what any normal house would be. I had been visiting Mr. Easby, and we'd been on the staircase, and it was time for me to go. And I just happened to peek through the glass doors and looked into the blue room. And in the arch, it looked like the room was filled with blue smoke or some sort of a cloud. It had no form. It looked like it was a blue sort of cloud. And I said to Mr. Easby, Mead, it looks like it's getting cold out. It looks like dampness in the air or something. And he said, oh no, that's the ectoplasm. I said, ectoplasm? What's that? And he explained it's some sort of energy that's being released, or it could be some floating spirits. I don't really know. I really feel there's a presence here. And when you're alone here, or it's quiet, it's like no other place. The whole world outside is blocked out, and the inner world here is very, very different. Lloyd Gross once gave a tour of Balleroy to a local newspaper reporter. While they were in the bedroom that had been occupied by Henrietta, the reporter's tape recorder was torn away from his grip and flew across the room. Gross recalled that the reporter was so shaken by the experience, we had to take him out on the terrace and give him a shot of whiskey. When the reporter later listened to the recording he had made, there was a dog barking but there had been no dog present at the time. 
On another occasion, a local minister came to visit the house. Out of nowhere, a copper pot flew through the air and hit him on the head. Although he was not seriously injured, the minister never set foot within the walls of Balleroy again. The spirit of Henrietta once led Meade to the dusty attic. In the eaves, he found a pair of antique silver candlesticks, which had apparently been there for decades. They were worth a small fortune. Henrietta also directed Meade to search her cabinet in the Blue Room. He found long-forgotten legal documents, which brought him another sizable inheritance. Another time, the psychic Hames was on her way to Balleroy when she heard a voice say the word, Longfellow. She asked Meade if that meant anything to him. Well, he said that his mother's favorite poem was The Children's Hour by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Later that evening, when he went to the Balleroy Library, one book was sticking out on the shelf. It was a collection of Longfellow's poems. The book opened directly to the page with the poem, The Children's Hour, and there was an old yellowed envelope with his mother's distinctive handwriting, which said, To my son, Meade, in the event of my death. The envelope was empty. On another occasion, Meade awakened suddenly from a deep sleep with the feeling that someone was sitting on his bed. There was an impression on the mattress as if someone were sitting there, but no one was visible. Meade told author Charles J. Adams, It's the kind of thing that happened when you tell people about it, they think you're making it up. I was in bed, but I don't sleep all night very well. I stay awake a lot. And the time this happened, I'm certain I was not dreaming. I saw a monk dressed in a beige robe appear in the corner of my room. I'd been thinking of a little business deal. Should I do it or shouldn't I? The monk spoke. No, Mr. Easby, no. And then the monk dissolved, so I didn't. The next morning, Meade found that his right arm was black and blue, as if someone had grabbed him during the night. He decided not to follow through with the business deal, and later found that if he had, he would have lost a huge sum of money. Later, on a trip to the ancestral Easby Abbey in Yorkshire, England, Meade learned for the first time that at Easby Abbey, the monks always wore beige robes. There's also an unusual haunting that occurs outside of Ballyroy's walls, a phantom car. This eerie visitation usually happens in the late evening, although it occasionally occurs during the day. When interviewed for Philadelphia Ghost Stories, Meade said, We don't see it, but very often we'll hear a car go by in the driveway. It goes right by the window. Many people have heard it, and we look, and there's no car there. My theory is it's someone in my family coming back to check and see if I'm behaving. Money was obviously never an issue with Meade. In 1990, he sold at auction a Chippendale carved mahogany tea table made between 1760 and 1780. It brought more than $1.2 million. Around the year 2000, Meade sold some furniture, which brought in between $3 and $4 million. After a lifetime filled with joy and extraordinary experiences of all kinds, George Gordon Meade Easby died on 11 December 2005 at Keystone Hospice in Windmore, Pennsylvania. He was 87 years old. He had been suffering from, quote, dementia of the Alzheimer's type, unquote, for several years prior to his death. Meade, who had never married, was survived by his partner of 12 years, Robert Irigoyen, to whom he left Balleroy and all its contents. Meade and Robert had met at New Hope in 1993. Robert moved into Balleroy two years later. In 2002, Meade had decided to change his will, and he told Robert he wanted a gay attorney to prepare it. After this initial meeting, he also asked for a gay financial advisor. A lawsuit was brought to challenge the will of George Meade Easby by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and Will's Eye Hospital, which had also been left money in Meade's will. 
It claimed that Robert Irigoyen had practiced, quote, undue influence, and that Meade was not of sound mind when he prepared the will that left the bulk of his estate to Robert. Robert Irigoyen stated in the court record, which also names Bellaroy as being haunted, that he, quote, was the decedent's longtime friend, lover, and life partner, and had lived with the decedent in the functional equivalent of a marital relationship for over 10 years prior to the decedent's death. The records from this hearing are public, and I was startled to see a few familiar names as I read through the report. Mead's family physician was Dr. Paul Mock, a family physician whom I knew very well from my nine years working as an emergency physician at Chestnut Hill Hospital. The neurologist quoted was Dr. Larry Smith, who was my friend and someone I frequently consulted while on duty. I worked at Chestnut Hill Emergency Department from 1994 until 2003. It would not surprise me to find out that I took care of Mead Easby in the emergency department at some point. Quoting directly from the court records, which are public, as the testimony evolved, George Mead Easby emerged as a private, complex, and very closeted person who behaved differently depending on whether he was in gay or heterosexual company. Like the film Rashomon, the image of me that emerged varied significantly depending on the perspective of the narrator or the witness. Friends who knew Meade well testified to his strong, tender feelings for Robert. Lady Wedgwood recalled Meade describing Robert as his dear, dear friend, how wonderful his life was because Robert was in it, and that basically he couldn't live without Robert. Perhaps the most vivid description of the relationship between Meade and Robert was presented by their younger friend, Walter Opdyke who recalled that when he made some offhand remark about Robert, Meade chastised him and said, Don't say that. I love him. Opdyke then recalled that Meade said that he would like to go, I think it was to Vermont. It was whatever state at that time had just passed a law validating gay marriages, and that he would like to go there and marry Robert. It was Massachusetts which approved same-sex marriage in 2004. That was the year before Meade's death. The record establishes that Robert and Meade had a long-standing loving relationship, at the end of which Robert not only gently cared for Meade by making sure that he had 24-hour nursing care, but also by assuring him the opportunity to meet with his friends in his beloved Valeroy. Based on the record presented, the respondent established by clear and convincing evidence the absence of undue influence. So, several years before same-sex marriage was legally recognized by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania in 2014, this court acknowledged that Meade and Robert were a couple. Robert Irigoyen received Meade's inheritance as his husband in all but legal name. George Gordon Meade Easby now rests in his grave at Laurel Hill East in the Stevenson family plot, close to his brother Stevie and his aunt Sarah York Stevenson. His great-grandfather, General George Gordon Meade, is a few hundred yards away, as he has been since his own death in 1872, the day after famed portrait painter Thomas Sully died. Sully is also at Laurel Hill East. The antiques and furniture of Balleroy were sold at auction to museums and collectors all over the world. General Meade's pistol went for $165,000. I wonder where the death chair is now and if it has claimed any further victims. In 2012, Robert Irigoyen sold the Balleroy mansion itself to new owners who maintain it to this day as a private residence. The current owners, whose names I am not including, have experienced unexplained noises in the house, as well as seeing the ghost of Stevie. They have heard the phantom car coming up the driveway, and they've been unnerved by lights in the house turning on and off by no human hand. In an article published in the Chestnut Hill Local, 
on 25 October 1984, just in time for Halloween, George Gordon Mead Easby had said, When I leave here, I'm coming back to haunt them. If they don't take good care of this place, I'm going to be right back here after them. In a 2015 newspaper article by Kevin Feely, the current owners of the Ballarai Mansion did say, We're Catholic, and just for good measure, you have the house blessed when you move in, even if it's not a haunted house. But we did tell the priest to take his time. As far as I know, there has been no supernatural activity reported near Mead Easby's final resting place. You can hear more about Mead in a walking tour on June 3rd at 10 a.m. when Laurel Hill volunteer guide Pat Rose tells his story in her annual Gay Pride Month tour out of the closet and into the crypt at Laurel Hill East. Maybe I'll see you there. And speaking of upcoming tours, we have a bunch of them for you in May and in June. Plus other cemetery activities in the warm weather. On May 6th at 8.30 p.m. Laurel Hill East, you can see a chocolate-covered Rocky Horror Picture Show. May 7th, 10 a.m. Laurel Hill West, Sacred Spaces, Story Places. Pat Rose will be your guide there. That is a general tour of Laurel Hill West. May 7th at Laurel Hill East, Designing for the Dead, Art and Architecture of Laurel Hill East. That is at 1 p.m. on Sunday, and Tom Keels will be your guide for that. May 13th, 10 o'clock a.m., Laurel Hill East. I am the guide for an accessible tour. It's a tour that I put together that stays on the paved paths. There are no steps. If you or someone you know uses a wheelchair or a scooter and you've wanted to get out to Laurel Hill, this is your opportunity. I promise you, you will get a good tour, even though we are limited to the paved paths. May 17th, 6.30 p.m., a virtual tour of Laurel Hill West by me. It's free, but you have to sign up so you can get the link. May 18th, 6 p.m., Laurel Hill West, talking about death. This is another free program that you can get involved in. The one that I'm proudest of is one coming up on Saturday, May 20th at Laurel Hill West, 10 o'clock in the morning. It's called This Sporting Life, Athletes of Laurel Hill West. I've been working on this one for almost a year now, and it will tell you of people who are in the Baseball Hall of Fame, the International Tennis Hall of Fame, College Football Hall of Fame, International Hockey Hall of Fame. This is a long walk. We're going to be walking a couple of miles almost around the periphery of the cemetery because these people are scattered all over the place. So put on your hiking shoes and bring a bottle of water, but come hear about all of these sporting heroes at Laurel Hill West. So that shows you what's coming up in May. I'll give you a foreshadow of June just a little bit because at the beginning of June, the first week, Pat Rose does Out of the Closet and Into the Crypt at Laurel Hill East for Gay Pride Month. That's Saturday, June 3rd at 10 a.m. And then the next day, she turns around, she goes over to Laurel Hill West, and she does a tour called Love is for All, LGBTQ plus stories of Laurel Hill West. All of these you can find from our website, laurelhillphl.com slash events. Come on out and join us. We have a lot of fun. Let's get back to the podcast. Just north of Philadelphia in the suburb of Glenside, you will find Arcadia University. If you are driving to the Keswick Theater from Philadelphia, you can't help but notice what looks like a large, otherworldly gray castle off to your left when you're cruising on Eastern Road. It looks like just the sort of place that might be haunted, and it is. Arcadia started in 1853 in Beaver, Pennsylvania, as the Beaver Female Seminary, a school designed specifically to train women to be teachers. 
At the time, Beaver was a town of about 2,000 people. It's at the confluence of the Beaver and Ohio rivers, roughly 30 miles northwest of Pittsburgh on the Ohio border. By 1872, it had become Beaver College, and it started to admit men. In 1925, Beaver moved all the way across Pennsylvania to a new campus in Jenkintown, a borough just outside Philadelphia between Abington and Cheltenham townships. In 1928, Beaver College acquired its current campus, the Glenside Estate of sugar magnet William Welsh Harrison, who had died the year before. Then, a few years ago, despite a proud history of nearly 150 years, Beaver developed a modern problem. With the rise of the World Wide Web in the late 20th century, Beaver found that Internet search engine filters were blocking potential students from finding their website. They decided that a name change was essential, as well as an upgrade to university status. And in 2001... Beaver College was reborn as Arcadia University. Arcadia is a region in the central Peloponnese in Greece. It takes its name from the mythological character Arcas, son of Zeus and Callisto. Arcas was a hunter who became king of Arcadia and taught his people the arts of weaving and baking bread. Arcadia was the home of the gods Hermes and Pan. In European Renaissance arts, Arcadia was celebrated as an unspoiled, harmonious wilderness. Its name today continues this tradition in popular culture. William Welsh Harrison was born at 267 Pine Street in Philadelphia on 5 May 1850, the youngest of three sons, billed to George Lieb Harrison and Sarah Ann Waples Harrison, who had married in 1841. Only 33 years old, Sarah Ann died just 10 days after William's birth. She is interred under a beautiful marble monument in the little visited south section of Laurel Hill East. George Lieb Harrison was the son of John Harrison, a pioneering Philadelphia chemist, an intimate friend and constant correspondent of Joseph Priestley. George started his studies at Harvard, but was forced to leave due to ill health. He studied law under the Honorable J.R. Ingersoll, but did not enter the bar. When his father died in 1833, George took over the family sugar refining business, and he prospered. After his beloved wife Sarah Ann died, George married Letitia Henry Mitchell, sister of famed Philadelphia neurologist Silas Ware Mitchell. William Welsh Harrison was named for Philadelphia philanthropist William Welsh, a founder of Episcopal Hospital, proprietor of the Philadelphia Gazette. William attended the Germantown Academy, and then he earned a B.A. from the University of Pennsylvania in 1869, followed shortly by a master's degree. When he finished school, he started working at the Franklin Sugar Refinery with his father, and two older brothers as a sugar manufacturer and manager. The Franklin Sugar Refinery was one of the largest sugar factories in the world. Sweetness was known to our primate ancestors and some early human beings through berries and fruits, and especially honey. Honey is an animal product. The raw material is gathered from flowering plants by bees. Sugar, or sucrose, is a vegetable product extracted from cane by human ingenuity and technical advancements. Sugar cane is a tropical and subtropical crop that requires large amounts of water and sun and back-breaking labor to harvest and process. The industry became dependent on enslaved people to do the work. Sugarcane was first domesticated in New Guinea, about 8,000 BCE. Maybe 2,000 years later, cane was carried to the Philippines and India. But even in 1,000 AD, very few Europeans knew of sugar's existence. In 1493, Christopher Columbus carried sugarcane from the Spanish Canary Islands to the New World on his second voyage. And by 1516, sugar was being shipped back to Europe 
from Spanish Santo Domingo, where the fields were worked by enslaved Africans. Although the first New World crop to win a European market was tobacco, sugar started outpacing tobacco by the end of the 16th century. By 1650, the nobility and the wealthy in England had become major sugar eaters, and the sweet substance figured not only in their foods, but in their medicine and in their literary imagery. William Shakespeare mentioned the sweet dessert posset four times in his plays, including The Merry Wives of Windsor, Act 5, Scene 5. Yet be cheerful, knight, thou shalt eat a posset tonight at my house. By 1800, sugar had become a costly but rare necessity in the diet of every Englishman. And by 1900, sugar was supplying nearly one-fifth of the calories in the English diet. The Franklin Sugar Refinery, where William went to work, was three square blocks, surrounded by Bainbridge Street, Front Street, Almond Street, and Delaware Avenue, up near what is now the Betsy Ross Bridge near Bridesburg. The land is now under I-95. The Harrisons purchased raw sugar from Cuba, Java, Indonesia, and through various American brokers. Sugar from Cuba would have been a product of labor by enslaved Africans, although there were also indigenous Mexican and Chinese contract workers. Sugar from Louisiana was from the labor of enslaved Africans until after the Emancipation Proclamation, when it became the labor of freedmen and women living in only marginally better conditions than when they were enslaved. The expression sold down river came into the language in the early 19th century, river literally being the Mississippi or the Ohio. Louisville, Kentucky was one of the largest slave trading marketplaces in the country. Enslaved Africans would be taken to Louisville and sold down the river to cotton and sugar plantations in states further south. The brutal work in the hot sun was tantamount to a death sentence, and enslaved men on sugar plantations rarely lived for more than a few years. Among Laurel Hill East residents who profited from this system were General Robert Patterson of Patterson Lion fame, a textile magnate who owned cotton and sugar plantations, and Stephen Duncan, who during his lifetime owned more than 850 human beings, second only to Pierce Butler in the United States. Duncan's grave is marked by a simple stone with only his initials. Also at Laurel Hill East is Dr. Rachel Lloyd, the first woman in the United States to earn a Ph.D. in chemistry. She dedicated her professional life to the production of sucrose from sugar beets, which were far less labor-intensive and did not require enslaved people to make the product successful. I talked about Dr. Lloyd in All Bones Considered, Laurel Hill Stories number 11. She invented what? In 1866, the Franklin Refinery processed about a thousand barrels of raw material a day at its Delaware River factory. By 1887, it was processing about 4,000 barrels a day. That's a million and a half pounds of sugar. Five years later, the refinery processed 2 million pounds every day, running six days a week except July 4th and Christmas. At one time, it was estimated that 90% of the sugar refined in North America came from this single factory. By 1894, the Franklin Refinery's gross sales were $42 million per year. William Welsh Harrison and his brothers became extremely rich men. A 2013 article in the Philadelphia Inquirer by Rick Nichols provided a glimpse of the extreme lengths that the Franklin Sugar Refinery used to keep its methods secret to protect the huge profits it generated for its owners. Quote, in order to mystify New York refiners eager to learn its trade secrets, it was equipped with a Willy Wonka-like room crammed with pipes and valves that was entirely a sham. The valves would regularly be opened and closed to no actual purpose. Their job was simply to throw industrial spies off the scent. 
William Welsh Harrison married Bertha White, 1857 to 1933, and they had two children. Their first child was a daughter named Geraldine, born in 1881, followed by a son, William Welsh Harrison Jr., in 1884. In May 1902, Geraldine quietly married John Child Anderson without her father's knowledge or permission. And the next year, Geraldine died in an equestrian accident. Within days of her death, William Harrison was trying to reclaim all of his daughter's possessions and attempting to evict his son-in-law from the Walnut Street apartment they had shared. The newspapers were full of this scandal for weeks. In 1881, at age 31, William Welsh Harrison purchased the 138-acre Rosedale Hall estate in Glenside. At that time, Glenside was unincorporated. It borders Philadelphia, about six miles from Center City. In 1891, Harrison decided to enlarge Rosedale Hall, add a gatehouse, and improve the stables. He hired a self-taught 23-year-old architect at the beginning of his career. His name was Horace Trumbauer. In 1892, William Welsh Harrison sold the Franklin Sugar Refinery for an enormous sum, making him even richer than before with a net worth of $3 million. That would be somewhere around $90 million in today's money. But on the snowy morning of 14 January 1893 at about 1 a.m., Rosedale Hall caught fire and burned to the ground. The Harrison family and their servants all escaped the blaze in sub-freezing weather. In fact, it was near zero that morning, and they found shelter in the stables. Harrison again engaged architect Trumbauer to rebuild the family home on an even grander scale. What rose from the ashes of the fire became Great Towers Castle, a sprawling 66,000 square feet just slightly smaller than Linwood Hall, later designed by Trumbauer for Peter A. B. Widener. When it was finished in 1898, it consisted of 40 rooms with lushly decorated interiors inspired by and rival to the great castles of Europe. Mark Meredith describes Great Towers in loving detail at his website, House His Tree, that's House, H-I-S-T-R-E-E, dot com. Great Towers Castle measures a massive 225 feet across with a depth of 185 feet. Built with gray stone quarried from nearby Chestnut Hill, it is trimmed with Indiana limestone. Its six towers of various sizes are finished with Gothic-style battlements, and the facades are interspersed with gargoyles, other traditional Gothic architectural features, and a carved copy of the Harrison coat of arms. Said to have been built without a single nail, construction costs ran to $250,000. At the time, it was the third largest house in the country. And when he saw what Trumbauer had built for him, William Harrison wrote, the name Grey Towers seemed more appropriate than Rosedale Hall. The principal room coming off the Great Hall on the left, what is the south side of the castle, is the walnut paneled dining room, which features columns and caryatids reminiscent of those at the Chateau de Fontainebleau. At the other end of the room, glass doors once opened into a since demolished circular conservatory at leading off to the west was the breakfast room, and beyond that, kitchens, etc. On the other side of the hall, directly opposite the dining room, is the drawing room, better known as the Rose Room, decorated in the style of Louis XV. A pair of sliding doors in the center of the room open under the ballroom, also known as the Mirror Room. The Mirror Room was ordered in France and shipped to America, along with the craftsmen needed to assemble it. Its Renaissance-inspired ceiling is painted showing the four seasons as women. The bedroom suites were on the second floor with their own dressing rooms, boudoirs, fireplaces, and marble baths. 
Despite the air of antiquity prevalent throughout the house, it was fitted with electricity and every modern convenience. The final years of William Welsh Harrison's life were troubled. For one thing, he had never recovered from his daughter's death. William and Bertha did not get along. Harrison discovered that one of his best friends, Francis Ralston Welsh, who had also acted as his broker, had embezzled $239,000 from him over the last decade. Harrison sued him and appeared in court, but the stress of this personal betrayal weighed heavily on his mind and his body. William Welsh Harrison had a heart attack in Grey Towers Castle, and he died there on 4 March 1927. He was 76 years old. His widow, Bertha White Harrison, sold the estate to Beaver College two years later in 1929 for $712,500. She died in 1933 at the age of 75. Both are interred in the family mausoleum at Laurel Hill Cemetery. It is in the bridge section. It's directly behind the Diston Mausoleum, the largest mausoleum on the property at Millionaire's Row. In 1962, Beaver College moved its entire operations to the Gray Towers estate. Mark Meredith wrote, Today, the ground floor of the castle is home to several of the university's administrative offices and the conference events rooms. The upper two floors have been sympathetically converted into suite-style dormitories for select freshmen, giving them an opportunity to experience life here as the Harrisons had done, with perhaps an added ghost or two. Yes, I have finally gotten to the ghosts. Arcadia University has many macabre and ghostly legends that are passed down through generations of students. Author and actor Josh Hitchens attended Arcadia University as an undergraduate from 2003 to 2007. He earned a Bachelor of Fine Arts in acting. The tales of the campus being haunted were widely known and talked about, especially those involving Grey Towers Castle. There is a student group known as the Society for Castle Restoration that conducts ghost tours of the castle and the campus each year during October, furthering the belief in the spooky side of academic life at Arcadia. The second and third floors of the castle, which were originally bedrooms for the Harrison family and their servants, are now student housing. They are highly sought by students who grew up watching Harry Potter movies and what a chance to live in Hogwarts. The Great Towers architect Horace Trumbauer based his design on Old Wick Castle in England, which was started in the 11th century. The exterior of Old Wick was used to represent Hogwarts in the Harry Potter movies. With that history, the urban legends of a haunted castle seem inevitable. Most of the campus hauntings are associated with the castle itself. According to stories handed down through generations of students, faculty, and other staff, the marriage between William and Bertha Harrison was not a happy one. By the time Grey Towers was finished in 1898, the couple's union had deteriorated so completely that they lived in separate wings of the castle. William lived in one, Bertha and the children in the other. Student housing today reflects this. Male students occupy one wing, female students the other. But the ghosts of the Harrisons remain. Supposedly, William Welsh Harrison had many affairs with the maids who worked in the castle, and many secret passages and tunnels were constructed to make it easy for Harrison to quietly sneak his mistresses into his bedroom. Bertha knew of her husband's many infidelities, but she refused to divorce him for the sake of their children and to maintain the family's status in high society. Legend has it that one day Bertha could no longer take the humiliation of her husband's affairs. She waited in a small room on the second floor of the castle until one of the maids entered the room. Only after Mrs. Harrison locked the door did the maid see the butcher knife in her hand. The maid screamed, and tried to escape the room, but Mrs. Harrison stabbed her to death in a jealous rage. 
The maid's blood stained the white walls to crimson. Since the Harrisons were extremely wealthy, the brutal murder of a servant was easily covered up. Most of the maids at the time were single girls from Ireland or France with no family in this country. So the maid's body was buried in an unmarked grave somewhere on the estate grounds. After the maid's corpse was disposed of, the white walls of the room had to be repainted to cover up the blood. But a few days after the room was painted, the bloodstains were again prominent. So the room was repainted white again, and still the telltale bloodstains reappeared after a few days. Finally, the walls of the room on the second floor were painted a deep red to hide the blood. In Arcadian legend, it became known as the Red Room, and its door was kept locked for many years. In 2017, Arcadia alumnus Christopher Klimovitz talked about the haunted Red Room for the History Goes Bump podcast. Rumor has it that some years ago there was a seance done there, an amateur seance with a Ouija board. Apparently some students decided to get together and want to summon the spirits. Well, you know how people say, don't mess with the spirits, things will happen. And it did. Apparently someone was attacked. Apparently it frightened them terribly. Apparently someone was sent to the hospital. And the rumor is that when you get there, Ouija boards are banned from the campus. And that has been taken down in the mythology of the school. In a 2016 blog post on the university's website entitled, Is Arcadia Haunted? Author Spencer Potts also brought up the legend that Ouija boards are banned from the castle. Nick Kerstat, a staff member at Arcadia, responded, Ouija boards are not banned from campus, and they will not be confiscated. I believe the rumor stems from an incident a few years back, but there is no reason that students cannot own or use a Ouija board here at Arcadia. So there was an incident a few years back, but exactly what happened we do not know. It was during Josh Hitchens' four years at Arcadia that the infamous Red Room was finally unlocked and turned into an office for the financial aid department where he worked. Josh said he remembered his excitement at getting a chance to peek into this legendary room. Its walls were still bright crimson. One of his supervisors who worked in that office said she always felt uncomfortable there, constantly looking over her shoulder while sitting at her desk as she felt that she was being watched. According to some students who have lived in the castle, you can sometimes hear the sounds of muffled screams echoing in the locked red room in the dead of night. The ballroom, or mirror room, on the first floor of the castle contains another ghostly legend, although not nearly as gruesome. During special events and dances in the mirror room, many people have seen the phantom figures of William and Bertha Harrison dancing in the reflective panes. The legend is that if you see the Harrisons in the mirrors, you will marry the person that you are dancing with. This kind of contradicts the tales about William and Bertha's supposedly dysfunctional marriage, but it sure is a good story. The Grand Staircase has a restless spirit, that of a little girl. According to legend, she was a friend and a playmate of Harrison's daughter, Geraldine. On a winter morning, the little girl was running down the staircase at lightning speed, eager to get out into the snowy wonderland that awaited her outside of the castle. The long scarf she was wearing got caught on the banister, yanked her body backward, threw her over, and broke her neck. Her body was found hanging from the banister by her scarf, and her ghost has been seen by generations of students ever since. Charles J. Adams III interviewed an Arcadia graduate student who wished to remain anonymous. It was for his 2000 book, Montgomery County Ghost Stories. The student recounted her experience. I was down at the desk by the main entrance when I was distracted and saw something on the staircase. It was smoky, gray, filmy. That's the best way I can describe it. It was weird. It was small, like a little child would be, and it seemed to sway slowly, as if it was hanging over the side of the railing. 
Now is the really weird part. I mentioned something about it to a friend a couple of hours later. She got very serious and told me that I must have seen the ghost of the little girl. And that's when I told her, and I'm telling you now, that up to that point I had never heard any story about any little girl's ghost in the castle. I guess I was just out of the loop, but I had no idea. All I know is that I never before and never since have seen anything like it. If it was a ghost, so be it. It didn't bother me. But I do really feel for the little girl if her spirit remains there. Then again, if you have to haunt some place, it might as well be a place as beautiful as that. To add to the mystique, students who quickly run down the staircase, perhaps late for class, report that they feel something pulling them back, as if encouraging them to slow down so they don't experience the little girl's tragic fate. The excited laughter of a small child is also sometimes heard echoing through the great hall, and the piano in the first floor landing music room sometimes plays by itself when there's no one in the room, and the notes are discordant and amateurish, as if a young kid was doing it. The former bedrooms of the Harrison family and their servants on the second and third floors are now student housing. They, too, are subject to paranormal activity. Students hear footsteps in the halls, but they see no one when they look out their door. Some hear the unsettling noise of a cane pounding on the floor. Legend says this is the ghost of William Welch Harrison, who used to pound on his bedroom floor as a signal for his servants to bring him something more to drink. Students see and hear a rocking chair on the upper floor's rock by itself, supposedly occupied by the melancholy spirit of Bertha Harrison, mourning the death of her daughter Geraldine. In the castle dorm rooms, students hear the eerie sounds of children singing nursery rhymes in rooms once occupied by the Harrison children, and they see faces appear in mirrors and closet doors opening by themselves, and lights turning on and off without explanation. Another haunted area of the castle is the basement, which contains entrances to more than 500 feet of dark cobweb-adorned tunnels that run underneath the grounds of the campus. The tunnels have always been off-limits. Many of them have been blocked off, but several still exist. In a 2009 Philadelphia Inquirer article by Susan Snyder, a public safety officer named Roy Surma was patrolling the basement of the castle at 2.30 a.m. He said, Just as I adjusted my radio, something clamped on my wrist. Of course, there was nothing around me. What it was, I have no idea. In the same article, maintenance supervisor John Haggerty reported, When you're in the basement... You'll see things out of the corner of your eye, and you'll swear somebody just walked by. A final specter haunting Great Tower's castle is known as Abigail. Stories passed down through the years say that Abigail was a young woman from a wealthy family who often stayed with the Harrisons on their grand estate. She reportedly fell in love with a servant named Toby who worked in the stables. Abigail and Toby planned to elope together. However, Abigail's parents discovered this upstairs-downstairs romance and locked Abigail in her second-floor bedroom. The next morning, as the Harrisons and their guests were enjoying breakfast on the terrace, someone remarked that Abigail wasn't present. Just then, they noticed there was a red fluid slowly dripping down the glass walls of the atrium. And when they looked up at the glass roof, they were horrified to see the bloody corpse of Abigail. Sometime during the night, Abigail jumped from her bedroom window and was impaled on the iron spikes of the atrium. Ever since then, people see the ghostly figure of a woman in clothing from an earlier time wandering through the woods at the edge of campus. Many believe it is the heartbroken spirit of Abigail still trying to find Toby in the afterlife. Great Towers Castle is not the only haunted location at Arcadia University. The stables, now known as Murphy Hall, are haunted by the phantom of a young boy who it is said was accidentally trampled to death by the horses. 
Within its corridors, students and faculty have often seen a young boy who looks to be about 10 years old. Then again, maybe it's Stevie Easby. When they ask him what he's doing there, he disappears. Spruance Hall was originally a maintenance building on the Harrison Estate, also the home of the chief engineer employed by the family. It is said that the engineer was killed here when one of the boilers overheated and exploded. Spruance Hall now houses Arcadia University's theater, where Josh Hitchens spent most of his four years as an undergraduate. It was not uncommon to see the shadowy, almost transparent figure of a man walk across the stage when locking up the theater for the night, Josh says. Josh says, I recall vividly during one class I had in the theater, we kept hearing loud banging noises and footsteps echoing on the lighting grids above the stage. Finally, the professor got up on stage and looked up, but he saw nobody up there. The professor shouted upwards, I don't like that. The mysterious sounds stopped. In Dilworth Hall, one of the several dormitories on campus, people have seen a male student run down the length of the third floor hallway between 2 and 3 a.m. and jump out of a window only to vanish. Arcadia lore suggests this may be the ghost of a long ago student who took his own life and is doomed to repeat his final moments. According to another Arcadia graduate, Kat Blyweiss, who is Laurel Hill Cemetery administrative assistant and the manager of the gift shop, the dormitory called Heinz Hall was built over the site of an old cemetery. Approximately 250 bodies were removed before the dorm was built, but the legend says one corpse was forgotten. This ghost has become known as Max. Students who live in Heinz Hall report odd happenings, such as showers that turn on and off by themselves, lights that turn on and off by unseen hands, and various other unexplained phenomena. So the next time, you head to the Keswick Theater, which was also designed by the prolific Horace Trumbauer. I did talk about him in All Bones Considered Laurel Hill Stories number 7, Building Philadelphia. Anyway, as you drive past Great Tower Castle on Easton Road, wave to the ghosts. Better yet, keep an eye on Arcadia website to see when they're having their next haunted castle tour. You might be standing in line next to me, because now I want to go also. of Biographical Bites from Bala, Laurel Hill West Stories. Guest podcaster and fellow Laurel Hill tour guide, Rich Wilhelm, will tell us about Charles Benjamin Dudley, a chemist who worked for the Pennsylvania Railroad and was deeply upset by the shoddy workmanship and poor quality of manufacturing. He developed standards not just for steel, but for fuels, lubricants, paints, and even locomotives. He was a co-founder of the American Society for Testing and Materials, which is an industry leader today. I'm curious to hear what Rich has to say about this man. The June edition of All Bones Considered, Laurel Hill Stories, you've learned not to trust me, but let's see if we can do this, is called Killed by Natives. It concerns four men who are interred at Laurel Hill East 
who were killed by Native Americans during the so-called Indian Wars, including Benjamin Hodgson, who saw his demise at the Battle of Little Bighorn with General Custer. Laurel Hill East is located at 3822 Ridge Avenue in the East Falls section of Philadelphia. An easy walk from the bus stop at Ridge and Allegheny for SEPTA buses R1 and 61. Admission to the cemetery is free, as is parking in the small lot across the street. There is an app you can download for a self-guided tour through its 78 acres. Laurel Hill West is at 225 Belmont Avenue in Balakinwood, with parking at the main entrance and at the bell tower. Your best bet for public transportation is to take the SEPTA Regional Rail to Maniunk or one of the many buses to the Wissahickon Transfer Center on Ridge Avenue. Then cross the Schuylkill River on the Pencoid Pedestrian Bridge, come up Riders Ferry Road to the entrance near the Pet Cemetery. You can download an audio tour of Laurel Hill West from the same place you're getting this podcast. Each of them is roughly a 45 minutes telling you about people who are interred along the route going from Pencoid to Barmouth, and then another one going back from Barmouth to Pencoid. Beautiful weather. Time to get out. Walk around. Both Laurel Hill East and Laurel Hill West are open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. You've heard me say it before. We welcome dog walkers, bike riders, photographers, painters, bird watchers, nature buffs, tree and plant lovers and strollers, both the two-footed and four-wheeled variety. Both Laurel Hill East and Laurel Hill West give frequent historic tours. And there's still an occasional pay-what-you-wish virtual tour via Zoom. Find out more. LaurelHillPHL.com slash events slash calendar. If you follow us on Instagram and Facebook, you'll get a daily reminder of our inhabitants and activities. You can also follow All Bones Considered on Instagram and Facebook. And once you've fallen in love with these hotspots, become a friend of Laurel Hill. You'll have the opportunity for several members-only special tours conducted each year, including some inside the mausoleum visits. And at least two annual members-only podcasts of All Bones Considered Laurel Hill Stories. They may be cemeteries, but they are a couple of the liveliest spots in town. Oh, and if you're looking for it online, the key to finding the gift shop online is to click on support and then find the gift shop in the left-hand column. Much of today's podcast came from the book Haunted Houses of Philadelphia by Josh Hitchens. It's copyright 2022 by Arcadia Press. You can find these two stories plus 10 more. We have a few copies in the gift store. But you can also buy a copy from Josh's website, www.joshhitchens.com. Our theme song, Names at Peace, was written and performed by local artist James Harrow. All Bones Considered, Laurel Hill Stories, and Biographical Bites from Bala, Laurel Hill West Stories, are researched, written, narrated, and produced by me, Joe Lex, retired professor of emergency medicine at Temple University, Reminding you to keep body and soul together until next time on All Bones Considered Laurel Hill Stories, where the plot thickens. If you wish to contact me, joe at joelex.net. Normally, I tell you to stick around to hear the references that I used on this podcast, but the references were simple for this. They were Josh Hitchens' book, Haunted Houses of Philadelphia, and then lots and lots of newspaper articles about these people. Maybe I'll see you around the cemetery. Stay safe, stay well.